If you guys know a thing or two about modern Russia, then you probably know that it's not exactly the most liberal country when it comes to free speech. Oppositional media in Russia is often banned and censored, people who voice their opposing opinions are under risk of persecution, and it seems like there's never a shortage of people strangely disappearing. And a lot of you guys probably think that this is only happening in Russia, or so to say, on the Russian side of the internet and Russian social media, etc. And that obviously Russia is not able to affect Western social media in a way like this and also delete the stuff that they don't like on platforms such as YouTube, Twitter, Reddit, or the extremist and banned in Russia Instagram and Facebook. Well guys, what's going on? It is your boy Roman, your favorite neighborhood Russian, and in today's video guys, I'm about to ruin your day because I'm here to tell you about how Russia actually influences Western social media. Now if you guys are not aware of the overall situation with Western social media right now in Russia, basically most of it is still available. For example, YouTube, Twitter, and Reddit still work in Russia as far as I know. However, the company Meta and its products Facebook and Instagram are now officially banned in Russia and Meta itself is considered as an extremist organization. And it's all because Meta essentially allowed certain and hate speech towards uh, Russians and Russian soldiers on the platform, which is a discussion of its own entirely, you know. But basically, Russia got pretty mad at that and banned Instagram and Facebook. And in another video on this channel, Ray actually talked before how Russia has been trying to create awful social media replacements for these platforms, creating this sort of uh, awful Instagram copycat called Rossgram, Russian Instagram essentially, and uh, that never really went anywhere. There's also certain replacements for YouTube that are being pushed right now by Russia. For example, the Russian website Rootube, Yes, very original name. As well as VK Video, which is actually created by Russia's biggest social network of Kontaktia, or VK. So now what they're doing is that VK Video was actually paying Russian YouTubers to do exclusive content on their platform in order to sort of make Russian people use YouTube less. But that being said, guys, small side note, due to the nature of my content and how it's very political, I actually don't get a lot of sponsors either, so if you would like to sponsor this channel yourself, go over down to the link in the description, become a YouTube member, it's like essentially YouTube's own version of Patreon, it's the best way to support me, it's like a monthly donation. Okay, e-begging is over, let's move on with the video. And since we're talking about the bans of social media in Russia, the main governmental organ of Russia that does all of this is known as Roskomnadzor which is a Soviet-style abbreviation that basically translates to the Federal Service for Supervision of Communications, Information Technology, and Mass Media. Clearly sounds like a very noble profession, but yes, Roskomnadzor is essentially the main governmental organ that is concerned with blocking and deleting information that is considered wrong in this or that other way, according to the Russian law and according to the Russian government. And uh, I gotta say, these guys are pretty much universally hated by majority of Russians, or at least the young people, I guess. And this is where it gets interesting, actually, is because Roskomnadzor, as essentially a part of the government of Russia, has the power to actually take down contents from YouTube and other Western social media and if you guys think that maybe now since you know everybody's kind of severing their ties with Russia and stuff they no longer have that power well guess what guys they do now to go into the history of Roskomnadzor on YouTube a little bit, Roskomnadzor essentially started first blocking stuff on YouTube around the year 2014 or so, and by that I mean of course blocking the territory of the Russian Federation, however a lot of what we're gonna be talking about goes further than that, but actually I remember back in the day one of the first things that Roskomnadzor banned on YouTube was actually dumb ways to die. Which is incredible, guys, and I've actually talked about this in the video many, many years ago, so, uh... And the first thing they did when this whole thing was established is they banned dumb ways to die. Yes, dumb ways to die. You know that uh, Australian subway uh, viral video that was supposed to raise awareness for people to be more careful on Metro? Well, that was banned in Russia for quote-unquote propaganda. Good job right here, guys. That clearly solved all Russia's problems, right? It's aged pretty well. And the thing is, Roskomnadzor and Google and YouTube in Russia actually have a long story of going back and forth with lawsuits and fines of all sorts of types. And it's gotten so bad that actually the Russian official office of Google filed for bankruptcy in Russia because they're simply not able to pay all of these fines that the Russian government has put on them. And essentially right now they're in a bit of a weird state. I don't even know what's going on legally. <laughs> and actually Roskomnadzor fining uh, Western social media has been a thing for a while now. Not just with YouTube. For example, just a few days ago, a Moscow court officially fined Reddit for 2 million rubles for uh, essentially posting uh, fake information about the special military operations, so, uh, and refusing to remove it, of course. However, this is pretty much where we get into the most messed up part, right? In certain cases, this content that has been blocked does not just get banned on the territory of Russia so that Russians cannot see it, it actually gets banned off the platform completely. 
So essentially what's happened recently, just a week ago, is that uh, Apple Podcasts, which is Apple's official platform for podcasts, <laughs> thank you guys, very insightful commentary, I know, has deleted two very prominent uh, podcasts from Russian oppositional media from their platform according to the request of Roskomnadzor. These two media were Holot and Meduza. Hold is a little bit less known, but it's a decent media that covers, you know, everything going on in Russia. And Meduza is a pretty well-known media at this point. Just like Hold, they publish in English and Russian as well. They're banned in Russia, considered foreign agents, all that classic good stuff, you know. So essentially, both of these media created by Russians that actually oppose the governments, they had their own podcasts on the Apple platform. And essentially, both of them got a message from Apple saying that, according to the Russian law, Roskomnadzor is asking us to take down your podcast from our platform, so I'm sorry, but you will have to do it. Now, apparently what happened to Medusa's podcast, it actually got reinstated on Apple's platform two days later. But still, yeah, honestly, very worrying. And one thing, right, that I do find ironic, very, very ironic, is that Apple officially left Russia, right? Which was a big move, right? So, yeah, Apple is standing with Ukraine and all that, but also what they do is that they take down uh, podcasts created by pro-Ukraine media, oppositional media that opposes the Russian government. So they take down their shit from their platform. So I do find it really interesting, you know, it's kind of like Spotify as well, I would say, you know, how Spotify also left Russia essentially and you can't even get premium in Russia officially. However, Spotify will still allow Z artists who literally a uh, propaganda, such as Shaman, for example, to literally just put out their music on their platform. And, you know, if you go on Spotify, Shaman, you know, you can listen to it all. You've got it all. And of course, it's getting monetized. Of course, he's making money from it. But uh, I would say they have the same approach here as, you know, a lot of uh, companies and even governments do these days to Russians. Essentially, they don't like you and they don't want you to, you know, live in their country or use their services if you're Russian, except if you're rich or powerful, you know? In that case, it's fine. <laughs> and look, I understand that to some degree this is probably an automated process and Apple did correct their mistake as far as Medusa goes, but still. Why is this happening in the first place if you're, like, actually taking a stand? Shouldn't you be not complying with these decisions then? Consistency! That's what we want. So yeah, that's quite interesting, but also another story that I saw recently, which is again pretty messed up in my opinion, is um, something that happened to a uh, Russian, or should I say maybe Russian-speaking YouTuber, Anton S. This is a YouTuber whose content I'm fleetingly aware of, he basically talks about celebrity gossip in Russia and like the post-Soviet space, as well as politics as well, and actually, he's a guy who runs his channel in Russian, but he's actually not even a Russian citizen and doesn't even live in Russia, and he's also openly part of the LGBT community, which is uh, something that, if you guys don't know, is a no-no in Russia these days, because uh, Russia has recently passed laws on banning gay propaganda, and here's what happened, essentially, quite recently, just a week ago or so, Anton S has received certain emails from YouTube essentially stating that Roskomnadzor has decided that a few of his videos uh, do not comply with Russia's information policy and the Russian laws and everything, so uh, you need to essentially delete this content or the uh, regulator will essentially be forced to block it. And the videos that they essentially found problematic was a vlog from six years ago with 48,000 the views, which is quite interesting, and also another video he did, which is more popular, which is actually his coming out video. Pretty obviously, these claims, these, uh, you know, attempts to block these videos come from these new laws of Russia outlawing essentially gay propaganda. And yeah, I mean, I do think it's a little bit ridiculous. I want to just uh, give Anton himself a chance to comment. Вместо того, чтобы деньги налогоплательщиков шли на, я не знаю, образование, на устройство туалетов, я не скажу, сколько там, 30% России ходит в дырку, сюда у нас деньги не идут. У нас идут деньги на просмотр сотен тысяч видосиков на ютубчике. И если какой-то видосик, а каждый мой второй видосик является гей-пропагандой в глазах Российской Федерации, в глазах российского законодательства, да? Вот здесь мы высылаем предупреждение ютубу, чтобы он удалил контент блогера, который не живет в России, который не является гражданином России, который не живет под юрисдикцией российского законодательства. То есть вы серьезно, ребят? Yeah, I mean, he said it all pretty much. And I'll be pissed as well, to be honest. Now, as far as I understand, right, when it comes to these YouTube claims, YouTube apparently will not actually delete his videos from the platform, he's not gonna get like a copyright strike, but his video will be essentially blocked in Russia. Which once again, you could say that, I guess it's good that at least his video is not gonna be fully blocked and deleted from YouTube, and his channel is not gonna have any ramifications, right? And that the video is just gonna be banned in Russia. However, that's already kinda messed up, isn't it? I mean, theoretically though, the implications of this are actually pretty bad, because for a lot of Russians, YouTube is one of their main ways of consuming information that's different from propaganda. And if you just go around blocking all these videos in Russia, then that access to information will be cut. 
YouTube sort of prides itself as a free platform, and I understand that YouTube has to comply with individual laws of the countries that it's officially in, but like YouTube officially is not really in Russia anymore, you know, as well. They've kind of left. But yeah, YouTube, for example, has explicitly said that they will be actually hunting down Russian propaganda on YouTube and, you know, essentially deleting uh, content that glorifies or, you know, promotes what's happened, what's happening in Ukraine right now. But also at the same time, not only is there a shit ton of Russian propaganda on YouTube, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, huge interview channels that get millions of views where it's essentially only Z takes being spread. I'm also talking about stuff that I've literally already reacted to in my videos. If you guys remember this Z West in the video I did recently where I reacted to this English guy promoting Russia in the video, that video was essentially uploaded on a channel that was created by the Federation Council of Russia, which is one of the main governing organs of Russia, right? So essentially a channel that is literally spreading Russian propaganda created by Russia, completely up and fine on YouTube, right? However, YouTube at the same time will still take in these requests Quests from Roscomnadzor and like threaten YouTubers with blocking their content for essentially not complying with laws of Russia. And I believe in the first place, right, if this guy makes his content in Russian, for mainly Russian-speaking audience, mainly in Russia probably, his videos potentially being banned from Russian YouTube will actually damage his career and his, you know, his life a lot. I just simply find it absolutely baffling that it seems like the West has sort of tried to sever all ties with Russia and as a regular Russian citizen, I'm feeling the ramifications of it. Essentially, I'm treated as a security threat to any bank in the world or to many countries in the world. I'm also treated like a potential security threat off the basis of my citizenship. However, at the same time, the governmental organs that are literally following the orders of Putin, they still have a say in what gets deleted or what stays up on YouTube and uh... I don't know, guys. I don't know. But basically, the thing is that all of the tools that the Russian government has been using to silence people on Western social media, they are still in use today, and they still work today, and these Western social media will still comply with it, which is, uh, I find quite interesting, you know? And maybe this is out of left field, but also, like, I do like how also Shaman, for example, all these Z artists. Once again, I did say that they're up on Spotify and etc. You can listen to it now if you want. But also, what I do find funny is that the DMCA, the copyright detection, still works fine with these artists as well. You know, for example, if I would like to actually make a reaction to one of Shaman's songs on his channel, I would get copyright claim for using his music, which is logically, I guess, from a copyright standpoint and from a YouTube standpoint, from, from how it's always been, it's logical, I guess. However, once again, I I do find it kind of funny and ironic. So yeah, guys, uh, hopefully you guys did learn something new from this video, I guess, because I'm pretty sure that a lot of Westerners are actually not aware that Russia still has certain influence over Western social media as well. So yeah, people, watch out. Watch out for all the misinformation out there. And thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you guys did enjoy it, then please make sure to slap the like on it. As well, guys, like I already said in this video, if you want to support me additionally, you can either do uh, the membership thing, go down to link in the description, or do a super thanks underneath this video. And yeah, guys, that is going to be pretty much it today's video, though. And I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.